I'm going to read through H is for Hawk by Helen MacDonald. This is in preparation for your Edexcel IGCSE English Language Exam, Paper 1. So H is for Hawk, some background information that uh, may be important. Um, this really is about MacDonald dealing with the, the death of her father by really distracting herself um, with a hawk. Hawks take a lot of time, a lot of concentration to train and look after. And so she, this, is her, this is her way of dealing with the death of her father. So we may see how the hawk might reflect her experience of mourning in some way, which we'll come back to later. I found this really difficult to annotate because I feel like I had much more to say. So I try to annotate the most important things um, for me. Um, but you may have to listen carefully because there will be other things mentioned other than my notes. Um, always bear in mind, these are just some things that came to my mind when I read it. Um, as always, you should really think about what you take from it as well. And I'm sure your teachers have given their own um, interpretation of it as well. Um, and they'll all be valid, just to have an open mind and, and I encourage you to have some original ideas. We'll check the ring numbers against the article 10s, he explained, pulling a sheaf of yellow paper from the rucksack and unfolding two of the official forms that accompany captive bred rare birds throughout their lives. Don't want you going home with the wrong bird. Now, hopefully you have read this already and know that she did almost go home with the wrong bird. So this foreshadows the plot twist and it's quite humorous to think now. Um, that he said this, considering that did almost happen, or maybe it does happen, because we don't really know. We noted the numbers, we stared down at the boxes at their parcel tape handles, their doors of thin plywood and hinges of carefully tied string. Then he knelt on the concrete, untied a hinge on the smaller box, and squinted into its dark interior. A sudden thump of feathered shoulders and the box shook, as if someone had punched it hard from within. She's got a hood off, he said, and frowned. That light leather hood was to keep the hawk from fearful sights, like us. So um, I think the most important things to note here is the onomatopoeic thump, um, as well as the violent imagery of the box shaking and um, as if someone had punched it hard. Um, so we know that the hawk from this is very powerful. Um, it seems violent, so that obviously the onomatopoeic sound as well as the, this language helps create tension. And the anticipation of MacDonald is, is mirrored with this, really. I mean, you can imagine how terrified she might feel in um, awaiting to see her bird. Uh, now the irony, however, is that um, the leather hood that is supposed to be over the hawk's head um, is supposed to protect it in, in some respects from us because we are fearful sights for the hawk. So it's quite ironic to think that the hawk would be afraid of us. Um, and I guess that's MacDonald communicating her compassion for the bird um, and her understanding of, or at least her aim to understand what the bird must be going through. Uh, what might help add tension as well is the man. The man is, is the handler of the bird, the professional, the one that's supposed to know what he's doing, and even he is frowning, so that causes some concern as well. So that helps add to the tension. Another hinge untied. Concentration, infinite caution. Daylight, daylight irrigating the box. Scratching talons, another thump, and another thump. The air turned syrupy, slow, flecked with dust. The last few seconds before a battle. I'm going to have to stop um, throughout this paragraph just because it's a really long paragraph. Um, so straight away we have these short sentences which help create tension and build that drama. We have repetition of thump. So again, we're just kind of anticipating this terrifying beast to come out of this box. Um... You might argue that this is hyperbolic as well, the last few seconds before a battle. It's at least melodramatic. And again, that helps build up that tension, that suspense as we await to, to meet this bird. And with the last bow pulled free, he reached inside, 
and admit, amidst a whirring, chaotic clatter of wings and feet and talons and a high-pitched twittering, and it's all happening at once, the man pulls an enormous, enormous hawk out of the box, and in a strange coincidence of world and deed, a great flood of sunlight drenches us, and everything is brilliance and fury. Um, so some things to note here... Um, you could mention the um, the alliteration of chaotic clatter as well, which kind of just adds emphasis to this moment. Um, but I think the syndetic listing highlights how overwhelming this moment is when she sees the bird. Um, syndetic listing is when you um, divide the items in a list with and rather than... Oh, se sorry, se separate the items in a list with and rather than a comma. Um... And that just makes the list seem even more extensive. So in this case, I think she's trying to um, communicate how overwhelming this experience was for her, seeing this great bird before her. And look at the repetition of enormous um, and the fact that the second one is in italics to add emphasis to um, just how big the hawk is. So again, just this sense of her feeling completely overwhelmed by what she sees. Um, there's pathetic fallacy here as she says just as the bird emerges there's this great flood of sunlight which happens um, to kind of fill her, her surroundings and everything is brilliance and fury so it's, it's pathetic fallacy because she's really viewing this bird almost like it's from another world or almost like it's godlike um, and that again you could argue one, she's in awe of the bird because of the way she's describing it, but she's also incredibly intimidated by it. The hawk's wings barred and beating, the sharp fingers of her dark-tipped primaries cutting the air, her feathers raised like the scattered quills of a fretful porpentine. So the description here just helps build that tension again. We've got alliteration with barred and beating. Um, which are plosive sounds as well. Um, two enormous eyes, my heart jumps sideways. She is a conjuring trick, a reptile, a fallen angel, a griffin from the pages of an illuminated bestiary. So again, we have short sentences to create tension. Um, it's quite hyperbolic again, um, referring to her as a reptile, a fallen angel, um, so she just seems to be from a different world. And I think, again, MacDonald is just completely in awe of her. She's never seen anything quite like it. Something bright and distant, like gold falling through water. A broken marionette of wings, legs and light splashed feathers. She's wearing jesses and the, old, and the man holds them. For one awful long moment, she's hanging head downward, wings open like a turkey in a butcher's shop. Only her head is turned right way up and she is seeing more than she has ever seen before in her whole short life. Her world was an aviary no larger than a living room. Then it was a box, but now it is this and she can see everything. The point source glitter on the waves, a diving cormorant a hundred yards out, pigment flakes under wax on the lines of parked cars, far hills and the heather on them, and miles and miles of sky where the sun spreads on dust and water and illegible things moving in it that are white scraps of gulls, everything startling it, a new stamp on her entirely astonished brain. So the short sentences juxt are juxtaposed with the extensive listing. So remember we said we have this these short sentences here. Um... And then suddenly we have this extensive list of all the things you can see. And actually, the short sentence is probably here to refer to if we're talking about juxtaposition. So this is the simplicity of her world. Her world used to be no larger than a living room, full stop. So the shortness of that sentence reflects kind of the simplicity and the shortness um, of, the shortness of her life, but really the simplicity of what she's seen before. Uh, or the limits of what she's seen before. And that's juxtaposed then with this extensive list listing um, 
highlighting in great detail to down to like the pigment flakes under wax on the lines of parked cars. So the the extensive detail in this list um, highlights how overwhelming this experience must be for the hawk. Um, so much so that she, her brain must be completely um, astonished. Um, something to think about here, I don't know how I feel about this, but it's kind of playing with this in my head, and please, I love when, by the way, I love when people comment and give their own ideas, because it really helps me as well, and I often share them with my students in class, um, so please feel free to comment and, and tell me what you think. But I wonder if this kind of overwhelming feeling of this bird who had, has lived this really sheltered life um, and has suddenly been exposed to a lot more, I wonder if that in some ways in parallel to MacDonald, who maybe before experiencing the death of her father had never experienced anything like that. And so in this moment in time, she's also feeling quite overwhelmed with the these new experiences. Um, I don't know if it's a bit of a stretch, but something to, to, to think about anyway, and I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Through all this, the man was perfectly calm. He gathered up the hawk in one practice movement, folding her wings, anchoring her broad feathered back against his chest, gripping her scaled yellow legs in one hand. So what we notice here is that the man is in great, it has great control over the situation. We have, um, for, in contrast to the chaotic bird and the, and the, the narrator, MacDonald, we've got this list of active clauses. So she's, he's in control. He gathers, he folds, he anchors, he grips. So those active verbs show that he's definitely in control of this situation. And the listing as well, and I haven't written this down, shows this clear process, this order of, of events that he needs to, to work through to make sure um, that he takes control of the hawk. So everything is very careful. Um, so again, he's just in great control, which is a great contrast to the bird and probably MacDonald at this point as well. Let's get that hood back on, he said tautly. However, tautly um, does suggest that he's a little bit concerned, but maybe it's more um, in a sense that he's concentrating hard and he's being very careful. There was concern in his face. It was born of care. This hawk had been hatched in an incubator, had broken from a frail bluish eggshell into a humid perspex box, and for the first few days of her life, this man had fed her with scraps of meat held in a pair of tweezers, waiting patiently for the lumpen, fluffy chick to notice the food and eat, her new neck wobbling with the effort of keeping her head in the air. So what we notice here in green is that he's been extremely nurturing and caring for um, for the hawk. All at once, I loved this man and fiercely, quite melodramatic, she has only just met him, but I think it highlights how vulnerable she feels um, and how reliant she is on him at the moment for his knowledge and his great control over the situation. Um, so th I think she's heavily relying on him. To, to feel kind of safe in this situation. I grabbed the hub, hood from the box and turned to the hawk. Her beak was open, her hackles raised, her wild eyes were the colour of sun on white paper, and they stared because the whole world had fallen into them at once. So we have that juxtaposition of compassion and understanding. Um, so what we're noticing here so even though we've got kind of wild eyes, her beak was open, there's something quite threatening about that. However, we do also see that she understands why the bird is maybe looks the, the way it does or behaves the way it does. It's because it's overwhelmed by everything it's seeing. And then the countdown here creates tension as well. One, two, three. I tucked the hood over her head. There was a brief intimation of a thin angular skull under her feathers, of an alien brain fizzing and fusing with terror. Then I drew the braces closed. We checked the ring numbers against the form. Um, so there's a sense of otherness here, the way she describes the, um, the bird with this angular skull, this alien brain, 
the alliteration here of fizzing and fusing. Um, so again, I'd, I'd argue here that MacDonald feels quite fearful of the bird and its otherness and how strange it seems to her. Then I drew the, uh, sorry, moving on. It was the wrong bird. This was the younger one, the smaller one. This was not my hawk. So obviously this links to the earlier part where I said the irony of him saying we don't want you going home with the wrong bird. Um, so this is the turning point in this short ex in this extract. Um, so this big build up and this kind of fear of this new bird and the, it's the kind of nervous excitement is kind of all for nothing because it's the wrong one. Um, what's what's terrifying here is that this is the younger one. This is the smaller one. So we've got tension here because we anticipate now a larger and much more terrifying bird than this one already is. Um, not to mention as well, I haven't put it here because I didn't, I didn't have space, uh, but look at the short sentences again. Do those short sentences help create tension or also do they um, reflect her disappointment as well? And then obviously the short paragraph and interjection O is an interjection, a lot of people might refer to it as an on onomatopoeic word, but it's not, um, which mirrors her disappointment, O. So we put her back and opened the other box, which was meant to hold the larger, older bird, and dear God, it did. Everything about this second hawk was different. So even just her expression here, dear God, shows her fear and her shock, um, and this short sentence, everything about this second hawk was different. This should feel, fill the reader with terror because how can it be much more different or more terrifying than what we've just heard? She came out like a Victorian melodrama, a sort of mad woman in the attack. She was smokier and darker and much, much bigger. And instead of twittering, she wailed great awful gouts of sound like a thing in pain and the sound was unbearable. So we've got again syndetic listing again this is an overwhelming experience for MacDonald. So we've got smokier and darker and 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 okay so that's what I mean by syndetic. Look at also the colours smokier and darker those have, they have con connotations of, um, of evil of mystery so it just seems so much more threatening because of that. The repetition of much, much bigger to emphasise that this is so much larger than the, um, the previous hawk. And then the contrast as well. The previous hawk twittered, but this one wails. Um, so there just doesn't seem to be anything appealing about this new bird. It seems much more terrifying than the latter. And even she says the sound was unbearable. You might argue that that's a hyperbole as well. Um, but look at her kind of self-address, if you like. This is my hawk. That inner dialogue, um, you could write that there. I, I didn't have space. Inner dialogue is almost her attempt to convince herself that this is okay. This is my hawk. I'm in control. I was telling myself and it was all I could do to breathe. She too was bareheaded and I grabbed the hood from the box as before but as I brought it up to her face I looked into her eyes and saw something blank and crazy in her stare. Some madness from a distant country. So again we've got this um, sense of danger and otherness again, this blank and crazy stare, this madness um, as if she's from a completely different world. I didn't recognise her. So remember before, and I haven't written this here, but remember previously, she seemed to be able to explain what must be going through the smaller hawk's mind. And she seemed to show compassion and an understanding of how overwhelming this must be for the hawk. Whereas in comparison, she says, I didn't recognise her here. So this hawk in comparison, she just doesn't seem to have that connection. She doesn't have that understanding. This isn't my hawk. Notice that contrast, okay, from this is my hawk to this inability to accept that she'll be able to look after this hawk. The hood was on, the ring numbers checked, the bird back in the box, the yellow form folded, the money exchanged, and all I could think was, but this isn't my hawk. So look at the repetition again. So she's starting to slowly convince herself that she cannot take this hawk. 
slow panic. I knew what I had to say, and it was a monstrous breach of etiquette. This is really awkward, I began, but I really liked the first one. Do you think there's any chance I could take that one instead? Look at the ellipses. That cr helps create that awkwardness, that tension, and the hesitation as well that she would have in even asking. I tailed off. His eyebrows were raised. I started again, staying, saying stupider things. I'm sure the other falconer would like the larger bird. She's more beautiful than the first one, isn't she? I know this is out of order, but I could I? Would it be all right, do you think? And on and on, a desperate, crazy barrage of incoherent appeals. Appeals. So here we've got, um, again, ellipses. So this, again, just shows how awkward and, and how she's kind of hesitating as she's saying um, what she is. Also note, which I didn't meant, uh, haven't written down, notice the list of questions as well. Um, there seems to be kind of a lengthy plea here um, for him to give her the different bird. I'm sure nothing I said persuaded him more than the look on my face as I said, as I said it. A tall, white-faced woman with wind-wrecked hair and exhausted eyes was pleading with him on a quayside, hands held out as if she were in a seaside production of Medea. Looking at me, he must have sensed that my stuttered request wasn't a simple one, that there was something behind it that was very important. There was a moment of total silence. So notice also her um, description of herself and how desperate she is. And note that she says he must have realised it's more than just the bird. There was something else in this. And here really she's referring to her grief. She's obviously gone or is going through at this point a terrible time in her life with her wrecked hair and her exhausted eyes. She is emotionally... Uh, an emotional wreck and very very frail at this moment um, and I guess she's looking for um, a distraction as she said um, okay so like I said in a previous one I know I used to write more notes for thoughts and feelings but my fear is that question four I, when I did these videos before the practice papers always came up with thoughts and feelings, but that's not necessarily the case anymore. This is a still quite a new exam, and so we're still learning the format. Thoughts and feelings might come up, but something else might. So just be prepared for all kinds of questions. Um, but if thoughts and feelings did come up, um, I'd probably divide it into, first of all, this anticipation and this tension um, that she feels um, in kind of even just the bird being revealed then this overwhelming feeling as well of of when she sees the bird and how she seems to be both fearful of it but also in awe so there's quite an interesting contrast there um she does feel compassion for the for the smaller bird she seems to understand its situation and that's why i think potentially you could draw that parallel with with the bird and mcdonald I think she appreciates how overwhelming it is for the bird because she's feeling quite overwhelming, overwhelmed as well with her father's death. Um, and lastly, I think she feels incredibly scared but really awkward when she is um, requesting the other bird. Um, so that's kind of how I would divide it.